Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth installment on our digital series on sustainability. My name is John Miller, president of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center. Uh, we're a charitable organization located at Muskoka Wharf in Gravenhurst. Uh, before we begin tonight, I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging the First Peoples, who for thousands of years before us were and are still the caretakers and keepers of this land where we now live and work. We're dedicated to honoring the Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in their spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. And in particular, from Muskoka, all four cultures, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Métis that inhabited these lands, either currently or historically. We recognize all the generations of Indigenous people and their historic connection to this place, and we are grateful for the opportunity to gather here at this time. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our final webinar. Uh, we've had six weeks of uh, an amazing experience uh, on sustainability webinars, and I'm so grateful for having you here today. Uh, our, our organization adopted sustainability as a core theme over a year ago as another step in our evolution to develop a vibrant cultural hub for the District of Muskoka. We adopted the slogan, Love Muskoka, Sustain Muskoka, Discover Ways to Make a Difference, as a branding statement for a sustainability initiative. Our goal is to become the physical and digital presence for community organizations and partners to encourage the will to act against climate change. Also to assist Muskoka residents and the annual visitors to the steamships and the Muskoka Discovery Center to discover how they too can make a difference through small actions of their own. Our project began in 2017 and is now a $7.4 million revitalization to increase the relevance of Muskoka Discovery Center to our region. Also to improve our financial sustainability by broadening our audiences. We're a cultural hub and a learning center and we're adding five new permanent exhibits, four of them in the 12,000 square foot edition you see on your screen. So those exhibits are a landscape of nations. This is an exhibit about non-indigenous culture and history of Muskoka for the past 200 years. The transformative steam era about the disruptive steam technology that changed the world and brought the world to Muskoka. Miskuaki, Confluence of Cultures. This will be a feature exhibit of ours in our new edition, uh, talking about the indigenous presence in Muskoka for over 13,000 years. And Love Muskoka, Sustain Muskoka. That's why we're here tonight, our sustainability theme. And finally, Wanda Three, uh, the electrification and relaunching of our 106 year old classic yacht. Our goal is to uh, re-enter her into commercial operation in 2022. So those new exhibits join our most recent permanent exhibits. Uh, one is Watershed Wonders, everything that you want to know about the Muskoka River watershed. We opened that in 2018. And Water is Life, uh, an exhibit on indigenous beliefs about water and a celebration of the water keepers, which was opened in 2020 last summer. Those two exhibits form our water gallery, which is really our first physical exhibit uh, surrounding our sustainability core theme. So also on the screen, you'll see uh, the cover page of Reflections Magazine. This is our, our in-house organizational magazine that we publish three times a year. It has a distribution of over 25,000 people. Uh, and this particular cover uh, has already been distributed over the past two or three weeks. Um, the birch bark canoe in the foreground is representative of our Miskiwaki exhibit. And of course, the RMS Seguin and Winona II in the background, patiently awaiting their sailing seasons. So now please welcome Kevin Boyle, Climate Change Coordinator for the District of Muskoka and our moderator for our, the series to introduce our speaker tonight. Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much, John. So um, my name is Kevin Boyle and I'm the Climate Change Initiatives Coordinator with the District Municipality of Muskoka. Uh, and we are proud to partner with Muskoka Steamship Discovery Center to put on this speaker series. Uh, and I've just been uh, really thrilled to be able to host. We've had, uh, we've had such great talks. We've talked on flooding, there's been education in climate change, terrestrial issues. We've discussed climate change and its implications in Muskoka. 
We had the Indigenous Sustainabilities Perspective last week, which was really great. Uh, and finally, we're tying it all together with Dr. Norman Yan from Friends of Muskoka Watershed um, with lakes and climate change in general. But first, we'll just do a little bit of the logistics for uh, tonight's uh, session. So I see it's beautiful outside, so thank you very much for everyone for attending tonight. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom of your screen beside the chat box, there's a Q&A uh, box. Now that's where you're able to type in your questions and also importantly, read the questions that have been typed in before. Uh, and then it gives you the ability to thumbs up or like the questions and they'll move up the ranks and we'll sort of get to them first and see how many we can get to uh, depending on time at the end. Uh, you won't be able to unmute uh, and this is really the easiest way for us to manage, uh, to manage questions um, for our session at the end. So without further ado, I'm, I'm proud to, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Norman Yan, who happens to also be a neighbor of mine, um, who was first with the Ontario government, then at York University, and finally with Friends of Muskoka Watershed. Uh, Dr. Yan has devoted half a century of work to understanding human impacts on Ontario's lakes, how the damage can be fixed, and its uh, reoccurrence prevented. Norman did his master's on the effects of acid rain on the microscopic plants in lakes, the phytoplankton, uh, and his PhD on the effects of metal on animal plankton, the little living lawnmowers in our lakes. He and his wife Sandy moved to Muskoka four decades ago and working from the Dorset Environmental Science Centre, he continued his work on the effects of shoreline development, acid rain and metal pollution in lakes. Um, and in 2000, he established a research partnership between York University, his new employer, and the Ministry of the Environment and broadened his research to include the impacts of uh, introduced predators, ozone depletion, climate change, road salt and calcium decline in our lakes. He also started an international collaborative uh, research in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Retiring, I use that term lightly, in 2014, Norman assumed a senior uh, research scholarship position at the York University uh, and chairmanship of the newly formed Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, a nonprofit corporation that fosters the understanding, choices, actions, and wise management that needed to protect Muskoka's lakes and watersheds into the future. Norman has co-authored over 200 scientific articles, a body of work that's generated over 10,000 scholarly citations. Um, he has provincial and national awards for research excellence and academic fellowships in Europe and Australia. And in 2012, an induction into the Academy of Science of the Royal Society of Canada. And so without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and my friend, Dr. Norman Yan. Take it away, Norm. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. Are we sharing? Looks good. Okay. Looking good. Well, thank you very much. Um, first, Kevin and John and Anne and Jason, it's an honor to be your final speaker in this webinar series. And I should start by actually thanking you for organizing such an interesting um, and well-integrated collection of webinars over the last six weeks. So I'm really honored to be your final speaker. Uh, my title, as you can see, is Imagining a Good Future for Our Lakes Despite Climate Change. Um, so I was speaking to a friend, Jackie Hart, who's a fellow uh, board member, and she said the best talks she's ever been to on the future of business usually address these four questions. Where are we now? How did we get here in our business? Where do we wanna go and how do we get there? Well, this, these questions work just as well for lakes. So I'm gonna organize my talk around these four questions and start by asking, where are our lakes now? Well, it differs stressor by stressor. And for two of the stressors, our lakes are in a lot better shape now. So that photograph of a horrible scum of blue-green algae on the lake is where lakes all over the world were in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And Lake, uh, uh, lake Muskoka was no exception. The view outside the window from the Discovery Center in the 1960s would have looked much like that in the summer. But as you can see from this graph, which shows phosphorus concentrations, there have been dramatic reductions in phosphorus concentrations over the years, which have solved this problem. Um, if overabundance of algal growth caused by overfertilization, often called cultural eutrophication, eutrophication means too much food. If that was the problem of the 60s, the problem of the 70s and the 80s was acid rain. 
And I'll just use an example of one of the most severely impacted lakes in Ontario, Clearwater Lake in Sudbury that lost all of its fish in the 1930s when the pH of the lake, a measure of acidity, fell to close to four. I actually started working there in, right here in 1976 and have worked on this lake ever since. Um, over the last 40 years, there's been um, a dramatic recovery of pH, a pH going from four to five to six. And when it hit six, fish reappeared in the lake. This fish can only survive when the pH is over six. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and this is also happening in Muskoka. The rain falling on Muskoka right now is 30 to 50 times less acidic than it was back here in the 1970s. So, but not all uh, stressors uh, have such good stories from Muskoka Lakes. And here's a few examples. While phosphorus levels are good, acidity levels are good, calcium levels have fallen dramatically. Here is the 35% reduction in calcium levels in the uh, seven lakes that uh, our colleagues, Andrew Patterson and others at the Dorset Environmental Science Center study. And right now, according to the Muskoka Watershed Council's summary, almost half of the lakes in Muskoka have calcium levels low enough that animals like crayfish that need a lot of calcium are actually in trouble. Uh, another growing problem is road salt, and that's measured by chloride levels. <clears throat> Our road salt is of course so sodium chloride. And you, the earliest data we have from uh, Lake Muskoka is back in the early 80s where levels were about two and a half milligrams per liter of chloride, already elevated over what we know of as background levels that are less than one. You can see a gradual increase in, uh, in chloride levels in most of the lake, but in Gravenhurst Bay or Muskoka Bay, levels are still going up. And at around here, at around 10 milligrams per liter, animals start dying in softwater lakes and 20% of Muskoka lakes share that problem. Um, here is a dramatic picture that's just down the street from where Kevin and I live in the spring of 2019. I don't need to say any more other than show you this picture to suggest that spring floods or the increasing risk of spring floods have become a problem in Muskoka. Um, many of you may not have seen this animal before. This is a little, a little animal called the spiny water flea. And it's an animal that is not native to our lakes. It's an invader from uh, m more than likely from lakes upstream of St. Petersburg in Europe. They like uh, fishing lines and downrigger cables. Here's a hundred of them attached to a line. Um, <clears throat> and this is a problem in Muskoka Lakes. I have called this animal the worst threat to our lakes since acid rain. And then our old enemy, algal blooms. We thought we had this problem pretty well licked, uh, but here from the Ministry of the Environment is a record of the number of confirmed algal blooms in Ontario going back to the mid 1990s. And you can see from around 2000 and on, the frequency of these blooms has increased. And what's more worrisome is most of them are these cyanobacteria or blue-green algae that can cause toxins. So question one was, how are we doing? Question two is, how did we get here? Um, so for the problems that we fixed, uh, cultural eutrophication, over-fertilization, and acid rain, uh, both followed these six steps. You know, we first recognized we had a problem. We don't want algal blooms, that's a problem. We want to have fish. If they disappear, that's a problem. We identified the cause, and that was non-trivial. Uh, to figure out which nutrient was the cause of overfertilization and why the fish were disappearing. But once we knew it was phosphorus for overfertilization and sulfur dioxide emissions from mainly from fossil fuel combustion for acid rain, we could then marshal public will. Uh, and when enough members of the public get excited, politicians will take action, uh, make appropriate policies to deal with the problem. In this case, it was get rid of phosphate from detergents and uh, build uh, phosphorus removal cells on the end of sewage treatment plants, perhaps move the effluents for sewage treatment plants, then sit back and monitor and make sure that it worked uh, and make sure the problem doesn't reemerge. 
This set of relatively simple steps was so successful that uh, if I can take a little tangent here, the group that I represent, the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, has adopted it as our approach to addressing our vision of healthy Muskoka watersheds forever. We track threats to the watershed. Uh, and if we see a wide scale threat, like for example, calcium decline in road salt, uh, that isn't yet being addressed, we ask ourselves, are there gaps in knowledge that need to be resolved before we can fix this problem? Uh, we then endeavor to raise the funds because normally we're gonna have to hire applied ecologists or people from universities to help us fill these knowledge gaps. That can take a few years and a little bit of money. But once we've got that done, we then um, attempt to generate the will to apply that new knowledge. And this cycle represents the approach to work that the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed adopts. So perhaps we can adopt that approach to the remaining problems. So question number two was, <clears throat> how did we get here? Why is it that we still have problems with calcium decline, road salt floods, invaders, and algal blooms? Let me address each of those for just a minute. In general, if I can find one word to sum it all up, it really has been lack of imagination. When we were making decisions in the past, um, we didn't, our, our imagination wasn't wide enough to think clearly about the problems that we were introducing down the road. So for calcium decline, which affects half of our lakes, we didn't consider uh, the legacy of acid rain leaching all the, so many nutrients from our soil that already are our soil is thin and nutrient poor. Here from Dr. Watma's lab at Trent University is about a 150 year modeled story of what happened to calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium under sugar bushes in Muskoka and Halliburton Lakes. <clears throat> Basically, look at this decline in the blue line. We lost almost half a ton of calcium per hectare, roughly 500 kilograms per hectare, and that has made our forests and our lakes nutrient poor. Lack of imagination. The same for road salt. Um, we pretended that we could fix our roads and didn't with uh, de-icing and didn't have to worry so much um, about where that salt was going. The reason we have to add it before every, uh, so often in the winter is because it goes somewhere. There is no place to throw anything away. It'll end up somewhere. If we put it on any of the hundreds of kilometers of roads in the watershed, it's gonna end up at the bottom of the watershed of Lake Muskoka. And there are currently about 12,000 tons, 12,000 tons of road salt in Lake Muskoka. Uh, for flooding, that amazing picture I showed of the spring flood of 2019 in Bracebridge Bay, I've heard Dr. Neil Hutchinson say, we kind of are living in a Muskoka bubble. We don't think it's gonna get us here. But in this webinar series, we've heard from Dr. Sachs, we've heard from Dr. Sale, we've heard from Dr. Lammers, that climate change is an issue in Muskoka. So here from the American government is the global temperature record. And this one degree rise in air temperature <clears throat> has had an impact on spring flooding in Muskoka. What about the invading species? Um, well, we all benefit from global shipping. All of these lines on this map represent a summary from Lloyd's of London that ensure ships of shipping routes around the planet. Um, and it's not one trip, in the yellow or the line, it's thousands of trips from this location over to North America. And there's so many ships coming in to the Great Lakes that we can't even see the Great Lakes on this map. So we didn't imagine that all of that ballast water exchanging that was happening in our legs could produce problems. And it's the main reason why we have almost 200 non-indigenous species uh, living in the Great Lakes right now that are spreading out of the Great Lakes uh, up into Muskoka, one of which is the spiny water flea. And lastly, resurgent algal blooms. This amazing photograph um, is a picture of Dixon Lake in the middle of Algonquin Park a lake with no development, uh, with an intact shoreline. Uh, this isn't like Rebecca talking about if you, um, if you clear the riparian zone, you're gonna have trouble. This lake has an intact riparian zone. 
But despite that, we had two years of severe algal blooms in the late summer and fall. Um, I'm gonna use this as an example in the rest of the talk for how we need to bring our imaginations to bear if we're gonna have a better future. Okay, question number three. Um, <clears throat> where are we now to quickly review? Pretty good for phosphorus and acid rain, but not so good for calcium decline, road salt, invaders, floods, and algal blooms. Where as a society do we want to go? Well, <clears throat> since about 2006, the Royal Bank of Canada has been much involved in uh, uh, water protection and they've done an annual study. Here are some of the highlights from the most recent one of these studies I can find online. Half of Canadians believe fresh water is part of our national identity. I'm amazed by that. I don't know if there would be any other country in the world, the possible exception of the Scandinavian countries, that would believe this. Um, I don't know, but I, I just find that a remarkable statistic. Uh, the residents of all but one province believe that fresh water is our most important natural resource. I'll leave it to you to guess which is the province that thinks some other resource is, the most, is more important than water. Most Canadians think our water problems are getting worse. 70% think climate change threatens our fresh water, both its supply and its quality. And the vast majority of Canadians, 90%, think that access to fresh water should be our right. So if this is what Canadians think, what does that mean about where we want to go at a very high level? Um, I believe it's fair to say that most Canadians want our waters to be better protected, less threatened by climate change and pollutants. Let me remind you that there's roughly 30,000 new chemicals introduced into the, into the world every year. So pollution can certainly be an issue. And many think that drinking water should be provided as a right. So how do we get there? My last question that I'll spend the rest of the talk on. I highly recommend anyone that's looking for a quotable quote, uh, look up quotes by Albert Einstein. Uh, in addition to being arguably one of the top few scientists of the last century and a half, he has more quotable quotes than anyone I know of. And here are three. We can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used to create them. When we created the calcium decline, the road salt, the flooding, the climate change problems, we weren't purposefully creating problems. So we're gonna, but now that we have them, we have to change our thinking. Uh, and what we have to become is less arrogant. And I just simply mean, um, I don't mean arrogant in the way that um, the past president of the US was arrogant. I just mean close-minded, that we're not thinking enough about uh, <clears throat> uh, about the ignorance that typifies many of our thoughts about the world and how we need to fix it. How we need to fix it requires imagination. And that's because in Einstein's words, logic will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. And it's this um, quote on imagination that led to the title of my talk, Imagining a Better Future for Our Legs. I'm gonna use the example of algal blooms for the rest of the talk, because it's an area that we don't, this, this phenomenon of resurgent algal blooms is new to limnologists who are the science, people that study lakes, I'm a limnologist, and an area where we need the most imagination. So let's start with the conventional wisdom of 30 years ago that may not be correct, uh, that we have to be, um, and for which we're arrogant if we think our past knowledge is all we need. <clears throat> we did think we understood the cause of algal blooms, and here is why. This photograph has been called the most important photograph in ecology. Um, it's a photograph of a lake in northwestern Ontario near Kenora that's been divided in half by scientists with a curtain. And these scientists, uh, particularly Dave Schindler and Everett Fee and others working in an area called the Experimental Lakes Area, um, <clears throat> were charged with identifying the cause of the over-fertilization of lakes that le led to algal blooms like this. Everyone suspected it was a nutrient, one of the main nutri nutrients of algae, either carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus. So to test which it was, they added 
uh, uh, tons of carbon in the form of sugar to this basin and tons of nitrate in the form of sodium nitrate to this basin. You might not be able to do this today because nitrate is a regulated uh, substance. And they did the same thing in this basin on the other side of the curtain, but then they also dribbled in a little phosphorus. And this is what happened. It was phosphorus that was controlling uh, the incidence of these scums of algae and lakes. <clears throat> and that was proven to be true over the next several decades um, because every time uh, phosphorus levels in sewage or in agricultural runoff was elevated and that, um, that increased amount of phosphorus was declined, uh, the lakes got better. So as a limnologist, we thought our knowledge was perfect. We were arrogant enough to think we understood exactly what we'd have to do to control the, uh, the risk of algal blooms in the world. And we were wrong. Um, so we have to go back to first principles. What controls the abundance of a plant? Well, algae are plants, and there are hundreds of different species of algae uh, in every single lake, and they have different preferences. They have different tolerances for lake chemistry, oxygen, and temperature, for example. Everyone that has a garden understands about species preferences because we all look for the, um, the growth zone of plants before we put them in our garden. You know, we won't put it has to be a, a temperature zone one to five, or we know it won't grow in our gardens. So preferences matter, but the rate of, at which the algae grow, if they're in a preferred place, is linked to nutrients, mainly phosphorus. That's still correct. And the rate at which they're, they die, which in lakes is caused by them being eaten. So uh, if that sounds a little complicated, let me give you a simple analogy. Here's an example, not of an algal bloom, but of a front lawn bloom. If my lawn looked like this, Kevin would come up the street and tell me to get that lawnmower working. Um, so what's happening here is either way too much nutrient supplied to this lawn or not nearly enough mowing. And the same is true with algal blooms and legs. So let's go back to this image. Where do the nutrients come from? Uh, those of you that heard Kevin's talk, Peter Sale's talk, no, heard about integrated watershed management. Here's a watershed for a lake. Everything that goes into that watershed can in theory get to the lake. Um, <clears throat> if the trees are cut down or killed, they won't act as filters. Uh, rainfall has about three times the phosphorus of lake water. And that's because two thirds of it is absorbed by the forest and fuels their growth. But if we clear shorelines, as Rebecca told us in her talk, um, or get rid of the forest, uh, we can end up with more phosphorus coming to lakes. It can also come from the bottom internally in lakes. If we do something to make the bottom water anaerobic, uh, free of oxygen, then all the phosphorus or a lot of the phosphorus stored in the bottom will come back into the lake. So we have to think about the whole watershed and the bottom of the lake in addition to the shoreline if we wanna control phosphorus input. Many of you that know me know that I can't give a talk without showing a picture of a Daphnia. Here's a little Daphnia. This is an animal that's about a millimeter or two millimeters long. They're mainly girls. This green uh, string in the middle is her stomach, her gut, and she's, it's green because she eats algae. Um, the entire volume of Lake Muskoka is filtered through the stomachs of Daphnia and all of her cousins. Um, every 10 days to two weeks in the summer. These are the little mowers that keep our legs clean. So um, let me try and tie all this together. All these new stressors uh, for legs, conventional stressors and how it might affect the risk of algal blooms. We get a, a bigger risk of an algal bloom if algae grow faster, normally caused by too many nutrients, or if uh, algae aren't being eaten uh, normally by animal plankton. Well, how does all this relate to stressors of legs? This is a little complicated, but I hope I've given you enough background to understand it. The spiny water flea that's now in all the big developed legs in Muskoka um, eats most of the zooplankton that are the filter feeders or drives them out of the surface layer of the lake. Road salt, uh, Chloride levels are high enough in 20% of Muskoka lakes, all those with roads in their watersheds that are winter maintained, that animal plankton are in trouble. 
Calcium levels in 50% of our legs are now low enough that animal plankton are in trouble. All of those things lead to less action of the little lawnmowers that eat the algae that keep our legs clean. On the other side, um, when we kill trees, either which we did historically by putting in culverts that were too small, you've all driven along the road and seen stands of dead spruce trees. And that usually was caused by floods or road building. And all the phosphorus that was in those trees leaches out over a decade or two. And we actually get blooms of phosphorus, spikes of phosphorus when we kill off the forest. These are the ones you're more used to hearing about. If we clear the land for agriculture, which doesn't, not much of that happens in Muskoka, clear shorelines, which Rebecca talked about, or develop without thinking about waste, we can end up increasing the load of phosphorus to our lakes, increasing algal growth and the risk of algal blooms. And so far, we haven't talked about climate change. So <clears throat> Peter Sale in his talk showed this graph. Um, this remarkable 60 year record of the increased levels of carbon dioxide and parts per million measured in Hawaii at the top of a mountain. Uh, the wonderful annual zigzag as a reflection of the breathing of the earth. When the northern hemisphere that has more plants tips towards the sun in the northern summer, the levels go down. When the northern hemisphere with more plants tips away from the sun in the winter, levels go up. And more than 99% of atmospheric scientists agree that the rising levels of CO2 um, is one of the principal causes of rising global air temperatures. So how does that relate to the risk of algal blooms? Well, look at this remarkable um, satellite image of the Great Lakes. Um, in the winter, when it's warm enough that the lakes haven't frozen, and look at these snow streamers coming off the lake. Here is Muskoka here being buried by snow streamers off Georgian Bay. Buffalo is here being buried by snow streamers off Lake Erie. Syracuse is over here buried by snow streamers coming off Lake Ontario. For the last hundred years, um, uh, a, a geophysicist by the name of Burnett uh, gathered up all the data on snow records from Syracuse um, and found that over the last hundred years, there's been an increase in annual snowfall on average from about 160 to 320 centimeters, about three meters. Um, and that doubling is entirely attributable to um, lake effect snow. And when we have more lake effect snow in Muskoka, we use more salt. So here's the first link to the stressors of climate change. <clears throat> what about temperature itself? Um, a group of scientists, I think mainly led by Dr. Sapna Sharma at York University, um, gathered data up from 240 lakes where surface temperatures have been measured fairly continuously back to 1985, and they published the results six years ago. Every once in a while, there's a blue dot where a lake has got colder uh, since 1985. I actually worked on a lake in Sudbury that's got colder. Um, uh, despite uh, uh, increased air temperatures. But the vast majority of the lakes are coated red. Uh, the vast majority of lakes, including everything in the Muskoka area, is warming, sometime typically by about a degree a decade on average. The, the lakes are actually warming faster than the air, and that's something I'd be happy to chat about um, separately with people. And, and why does that matter? A brilliant Daphnia biologist, whose name is Winfried Lampert from Germany, is probably considered the world's foremost uh, expert on the biology of Daphnia, this little water flea that keeps our legs clean. Um, one of his hundreds of papers looked at temperature effects on the growth rates of different lines, different genetic lines of Daphnia in the lab. And you can see that they were actually kind of happier as the temperature was raised from 17 to about 28 degrees, they grew faster. But then they hit a wall. Uh, and then when you warm the temperature beyond about 28 degrees, they all started to suffer and die. Now, I'll apologize in a way, this is my most complicated graph, but it's important to understand the link between 
temperature and the stressors. So I'm going to spend a minute or two on it. One of my students, Don Ashforth, was very interested in the interactive effect of global warming and calcium decline. So she did experiments with the little water flea Daphnia here in Dorset. She reared them in chambers at four different temperatures. You'll notice no bars here with the cross hatches. That's because at 32 degrees, they all died. So they couldn't produce any babies. I want you to look at the 28 degrees centigrade bar, this gray one here, and see that as long as the calcium was over one and a half, one and a half, two, five, ten. The height of that gray bar is the same. So calcium didn't have much impact on how many babies Daphnia could produce to replenish their population, as long as the calcium was over one and a half. But at one and 0.5, the animals were in trouble and the warming from 24 to 28 degrees had a bigger impact. So there was an impact of falling calcium and rising temperature on the health of the little animals that keep our legs clean. When I started working here 30 years ago, our legs never hit 28 degrees. That was high temperature. They now on occasion hit that 28 degrees in the summer. And as the Muskoka Watershed Council has summarized, half of the lakes in Muskoka now have calcium levels less than two milligrams per liter. Um, the average uh, calcium level has fallen about 25%. Okay, <clears throat> so that's calcium and salt, two of the stressors. Flooding, here's flooding. That former picture of the amazing spring tw uh, 2019 flood was taken from up here. Here I walked down the hill and took this picture a few minutes from where Kevin and I live and all these trees are not aquatic trees, they are flooded. And you can see the potential for erosion and that's increased nutrient supply, including phosphorus. Now, um, here is what might be the most surprising result to you of climate warming that might have consequence for blue-green algal blooms. And that is that it's not as windy now as it was 40 years ago in the summer. So Huasha Yao tracks the meteorological station at Dorset. And along with um, Dr. Lewis Malat, who generated this graph from York University, he was very interested in wind. And the blue line here from Huasha's data is the number of days in June, July, and August, sort of 90 days in total, where the wind speed, where it was calm, where the wind speed was less than 1.4 meters a second. There's actually been almost a doubling in the number of calm days in the summer. Whoops. Uh, and similarly, <clears throat> a dramatic decline number of days uh, that are stormy. And we'll point out that the algal bloom in Dixon Lake happened here, um, a year where there was essentially no windy days. It was 2014 and 2015. So there might be a link between wind and the uh, risk of algal. Okay, so let me sum all this up. How can climate change be a threat multiplier for these stressors that can increase the risk of algal blooms in Muskoka Lakes? First of all, by damaging the little living lawnmowers in our lakes, uh, as our lakes get saltier or warmer or have less calcium um, and more spiny water fleas, although there's not a direct link to climate change there, those four factors can all damage animal plankton that keep our lakes clean. <clears throat> there could be increased nutrient supplies from flooding if there's increased erosion. And then the habitat might just get her, might just get better for blue-green algae. They like the water to be warm. They like low wind speeds because low wind speeds means the lake is mixed less and blue-green algae better than other algae can maintain themselves in the water column. And the diatoms that we'd rather have have heavy glass shells that tend to sink more. They need wind to keep them in the water column. Um, if there's lower wind and it's warmer, the lakes might turn over later in the fall and that might provide more opportunity for the bottom waters to go anaerobic. Or if the fall overturn when lakes mix happens after leaf fall, the lakes might still be warm enough for the nutrients coming from the leaves. You can think of various mechanisms by which this all might come to play. So let, let's add climate change to this figure. 
So this is exactly the same figure as I showed before, but now I'm adding climate change to it. And I'm suggesting that it might make the habitat directly better for blue-green algae because it's warmer and not as well mixed. If there's more lake effect snow, there might be more road salt. If it gets too warm, that might kill the animals directly, all of which leads to lower algal death. Um, or there might be more erosion if there's more flooding. There might be more anoxia at the bottom. You could think of all, you could imagine all kinds of links, all of which we would need to study to see which of these are really, there's no doubt that we're having more algal blooms. We just don't know exactly why that's happening yet, but there's a whole bunch of logical explanations. Okay, we don't want those, these algal blooms. Uh, we want our lakes to be healthy forever. Uh, Canadians in general think climate change is a risk. How do we get there? I'll finish with four or five slides on how we get there. I don't have answers, <clears throat> but I have suggestions and here they are. Um, let's start by don't ignore the big questions. And let's go back to Dr. Einstein, who said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem, using my imagination, and then five minutes thinking about solutions. God forbid we find a solution to the wrong problem. Um, so here's maybe my craziest idea, is that we build a place, and I can't think of a better place to do it than at the Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center, where we can imagine a sustainable future and pose the really big questions about sustainability. There's lots of groups around Muskoka, like the Summit on the Environment, the Watershed Council, the Lake Associations, the Steamship and Discovery Center, the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed, um, the district that are thinking about various components of how to make the environment a better place in the future. But there's no one place where all of this is happening and where we can let our imaginations uh, address this regularly, once a year, for example, on the big questions. Here is my list of some big questions such an Imaginarium might consider. You know, how can Indigenous and non-Indigenous worldviews and knowledge support each other? How do we build both knowledge and will? Um, I've spent all my life building the knowledge, but I know nothing about how to generate will, except, or at least not professionally. This is the area of environmental psychology. Um, I know nothing about the arts, except that I know that the arts uh, are better than the sciences at bringing people's views together. And so we need them to help build will. I know that we always talk about ecology and its fundamental role, but when it comes to the dollar, it often gets left behind. I will point out one exception. When the district hired Kevin Boyle, that to me was a, a fabulous demonstration and that we were willing to put our money where the uh, where our mouths would be and actually do something about protecting our environment rather than just talking about it. Thank you, Kevin. You're doing a great job. Um, uh, how do professionals and citizens work together? We're all in this together, and um, uh, and unless we get the citizens as involved as the professionals, we're in trouble. I love this question about should nature have rights? We now have the first place in Canada where nation, a natural feature has been given the rights as a person. I have friends that are lawyers that say it's a terrible idea. I have friends that are ecologists that say it's a great idea. And my favorite question, if we protect the forest and the little animal plankton that I love, will they really protect us? So those are big questions. I hope you'll, uh, so my second point was fix the problems that we understand. Um, I, having stated those big questions, to me, these problems now seem relatively easy to solve. We have the knowledge, we don't necessarily have the will. We have too much salt, we know how to reduce it, we need to do it. Or somebody somewhere in Ontario knows how to reduce it, let's get on with it. Uh, there really are too many invaders, this one is more difficult to deal with. Um, and the federal government is dealing with them, there aren't uh, ballast water controls are a lot stronger now, but this is still a real issue, the slow spreading of invading species. I'm going to talk a little bit now about how the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed is helping to deal with one of these issues, which is too little calcium, and then I'll come back to algal blooms at the end. Many of you know that the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed 
uh, runs the Ash Muskoka problem, uh, whose intent is to get hundreds of Muskoka residents involved in helping to restore our <clears throat> forest from the calcium decline problem. Hundreds of people, many of you will know these four, uh, <clears throat> are collecting ash on our behalf. Um, this is Janice House, one of our volunteers, spreading ash um, in Ken Riley's sugar bush. This is what eight tons per hectare of ash looks like spread on, on the leaves in the fall. Here is early evidence that it's working. <clears throat> uh, from Holly Dayton's master's thesis done with Sean Wadma at Ken, in Ken Riley's sugar bush. When we added ash, here's what the calcium levels were in the leaves and the shoots and the roots of maple seedlings the next summer, 50, 100, and 175% increases. These little seedlings were coming alive. So um, how do we address problems that we truly don't understand? Um, here's that bloom in Dixon Lake again. On Gulfin Park, calcium levels are really low. Could this be caused by falling calcium levels coupled with warmer water in the fall, killing off zooplankton so little lawnmowers are gone? Could it have to do uh, with logging in the watershed of the lake? Might it have to do with the fact that it was a very calm summer? And so the waters didn't mix and the bottom went anaerobic and all the phosphorus came back onto the bottom. We simply don't know. Uh, and until we know, um, we should use our imaginations to think about the knowledge we need to address these widespread problems because we do not want algal blooms in our legs like this because they're often toxic. And it's shocking to see them happening in a completely undeveloped nutrient poor lake in the middle of Algonquin Park. What sort of information do we need? Well, I think we need real time continuous monitoring of bottom water oxygen levels and temperature in areas of lakes that are called blue-green algal nurseries. This is a wonderful continuously monitoring robot with the wonderful name of Thelma. There is also a Louise. Um, so Thelma and Louise are the only two robots run by uh, the Dorset Environmental Science Center <clears throat> that are continuously measuring conditions in lakes, but they're not located in blue-green algal nursery areas. Uh, and that is where we need them if we're going to sort out this problem. We also need, I believe, the sorts of infrastructure shown here that we don't have now. We need to be able to conduct experiments on the interactive effects of multiple stressors on the risk of algal blooms, either on land, such as in this uh, Swiss Federal Institute, or in the water with columns like these. These are, this would be a really fancy one. This one is actually in the North Sea but there are simpler ones that people have used in Muskoka. And this would allow us to eliminate logical, plausible explanations that turn out not to be the case. Uh, we don't, we don't, we're not doing that yet, uh, but it's something that I think needs to be done. Number four is we need to support Kevin Boyle and the district's uh, New Leaf Muskoka climate strategy. And I'll just mention that the wood ash project may in fact make a contribution here because not only will we make forests healthier if we add calcium, um, we'll increase photosynthesis, we should dramatically increase wood production and carbon capture from the atmosphere. So all, if we can make the forest healthier, it will look after us. In this case, by sucking more carbon out of the atmosphere. Finally, um, a tiny sales pitch. The vision of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed is listed here, very compatible with the vision of the Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center and other groups in Muskoka. Our mission, as Kevin said at the start, is to foster the understanding choices, actions that underpin wise management needed to protect our freshwater ecosystems forever. And we thank the Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center for helping us communicate the results of our work. If you'd like more information, on what we do, I invite you to visit the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed's website listed here, and you'll see a donation button in the top right-hand corner. Um, like the Steamships and Discovery Center, we're a membership-driven and donor-driven organization. We can't do anything without your support. So how do I conclude? This is the last talk of the six. Um, they all tie together, indicating that we need knowledge and will 
to solve our issues of sustainability in Muskoka. I would suggest to you that knowledge is underpinned by humility, the willingness to be open-minded and the exact opposite of arrogance. And will is underpinned by hope, the kind of hope that's generated by knowledge, uh, by good stories, by evidence that we've solved big environmental problems in the past and we can do it again. And we need imagination uh, to underpin humility and hope. And I'll leave it there. And I thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Norm. That, that was great. Uh, uh, you took us on a bit of a journey there from, I, li I like the theme of where we started, how we got there, um, where we want to go, and, and what are some of the things we can do. And, and I think that you, you're you right. It's knowledge, will, and I think the last thing is, is action. So thank you very much. What a, what a great talk and a great way to pin in um, all the rest of the discussions. I know you, you brought in Rebecca's and Kevin Trimble's and uh, Dr. Sale and Lammers. And uh, so I think that's a really great way to sort of uh, sum up our speaker series. But I, I am also uh, uh, going to have some questions for you. So we'll do a little bit of a, a Q&A right now. So uh, to start with, um, and this one, this one gets asked a lot, uh, what is the viable alternative to road salt? Uh, and do you know if the towns uh, have considered these? Um, the first viable alternative is to use less. Um, <clears throat> and this is where, of course, economics gets into it too. Um, what has been done at the Ryerson University campus, for example, is they reduced their use of road salt by 50%. And the way they did that was to actually identify how many of their parking lots they had to keep clear in the winter and switching from um, particulate salt to brines. Um, there are other larger, more general things we can do. Um, and this is being actively pursued by uh, Landscape Ontario and a bunch of other groups. There are insurance implications. Uh, there are contractual implications. For example, um, road salt uh, should not be an extra in contracts because then people tend to use it all. I will say that the highways people uh, and I believe the district uh, road managers are doing a pretty good job. Um, the, first I would the first thing I would like to do is sort out why the chloride levels keep going up in uh, Muskoka Bay. Uh, is, it, um, is it the wharf? Um, is it the highway going through the town? Uh, most of Gravenhurst is in the watershed of that bay. Are people using more salt? Uh, it will take a number of uh, approaches to deal with it. I know on my property, I use a total of about a cup of salt all winter. <clears throat> there are two little spots where I tend to accumulate ice. Um, and so that's the only spots I use it. If you've added salt to your driveway or your sidewalk and the next morning there's, there's salt there, shovel it up uh, and use it again down the road. So we tend to not think about salt as something we're throwing away and we need, and that's gonna show up and, and harm us some other way and that's what we need to do. Now there are other salts that can be used, other solutions. Uh, there are organic de-icers. Um, other people use other salts, not sodium chloride, but magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. Uh, they're more expensive and that's uh, the main reason they're not being used. But I think the thing to do is start with the simple solutions. Shovel more, salt less. Um, only use about a, a don't, uh, more is not better when it comes to salt. If you're putting more down, then actually, and don't use it to actually melt your way through the ice. You want to put it down before the ice forms in a thin layer. And I think Kevin, you once showed about a cup per square yard or something like that is all you need. People tend to use a it's actually a tablespoon, a tablespoon per spread evenly across a sidewalk block. Okay. Does that help? I, I think that's a great response. You went, you went over a couple things there. Um, I, I will add a little pitch for the district that uh, we're still in the midst of an engineered trial to use uh, from going from straight salt to some uh, pre-treated salt. Uh, which yes is more um, expensive but uh, actually we can reduce the amount of salt we use so we're, we're undergoing a trial with our engineering and public works there but um, 
Uh, yeah, the other thing I'll mention is the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed has chosen road salt uh, after calcium decline as the second issue we would like to address. Calcium decline affects half of our lakes. Road salt affects about 20% of our lakes. And we, but we've been unsuccessful so far in raising the funds that we need to address uh, the knowledge gaps um, that we want to address in terms of figuring out how exactly we can reduce road salt, starting with Muskoka Bay. We have a plan, we just don't have the support for it yet. Gotcha. Um, well, I think pushing that, that leads right into this question from Terry Reese. Um, can you talk about uh, how or if lakes recovered from chloride impacts over time? Is there a longer term prognosis? Okay, thanks, Terry. I'm glad you're on the call. Um, <clears throat> one of the really good things about road salt, unlike, for example, issues like mercury, is that um, it recovers as fast as the lakes flush. So essentially all the road salt we add dissolves almost with the next storm. A little tiny bit of it attaches to the soil, but that saturates very quickly and most of it just moves with the water. So Lake Muskoka has a renewal time of about a dozen years, I think. So if we cut off, if we made dramatic reductions in the salt input to Lake Muskoka, um, we would see the results over the next decade. Uh, we would see it much more rapidly in rivers, you know, because um, once you have salt laden uh, waters and you don't um, load the incoming waters with salt, the next pulse of water will be clean. I guess that's uh, 12 years. That's one of those environmental impacts that if reduced, uh, that's a very short period of time to, to repair a lake from, from a, a stress. Most stressors I would think would take a lot longer than that. Would that be correct? Yeah, the, one of the advantages of being in my 70s is I've been at this for 40 years. So I've seen um, some things like phosphorus and acid rain recover because the lakes were able to flush enough times that they reflected the reduced input. So chloride, um, if we could get chloride input rates down, that would be among the fastest rates of natural recovery we would see. Gotcha. And and so I, I, we've got a, a question from Carolyn. We're going to switch switch talk topics back and forth here now. Um, and this is specific to I think one of the studies where you showed where uh, it was a lake that the the pH level went so low that it lost all its fish in Sudbury, I believe. And so uh, from Carolyn, how did the fish suddenly appear when the pH levels reached uh, six? Uh, where did they come from? Uh, probably a bit of a mix. That lake is connected to two other lakes um, uh, by <clears throat> wetlands that in the spring would have uh, a foot of water in them connected to Clearwater Lake. So those, those fish probably swam upstream um, into that lake. There was a great study done by a fisheries professor at U of T who tagged some fish over in Halliburton and then he tracked where they went. And in a day, fish had moved two lakes over. So if there are no waterfalls that are keeping fish apart, they actually will move from lake to lake. Um, now there also could have been bait bucket introductions of some of them, uh, but I suspect that that introduction was natural uh, because uh, from that particular lake, it's Long Lake, two lakes away, and Long Lake never acidified. So there's a lake two lakes away that never acidified and wouldn't have lost its fish. And that's probably where the fish came from that got into Clearwater Lake. Um, I showed a Sudbury Lake, but I should tell you that the acidity of lakes in Muskoka is also declining, just not quite as dramatically. And I wanted a dramatic example. Gotcha. Um, all right, well, I, we're, we're bouncing around here with the questions that I like. We're hitting a lot of the different topics that you covered to tie everything uh, together tonight. So. Uh, from Mike, what are the implications for GHG sequestration from correcting the calcium decline in trees in Muskoka? So I know you touched on that, but maybe you could just sort of give, you know, okay. what, what would, if the trees are growing more, what's that mean for, for carbon? So we all have this image that tr trees in Canada are asleep in the winter and awake in the summer. Now in the mixed hardwood forests of Southern Ontario and Quebec and the Maritimes, just climatically should be our most productive forests in Eastern uh, Canada. Um, but because the soils are limited by calcium, 
uh, sorry, the trees have been limited by calcium stripped from the soil, mainly by acid rain. They have not been as productive as they should have been. They haven't photosynthesized as much. They haven't captured as much carbon. They haven't given off as much oxygen. They're not as strong. A calcium limited tree is 30% weaker, so they're more vulnerable to blowdown. And they don't transpire as much water. So their Muskoka watersheds are actually a bit more vulnerable to flooding because this, the forest soils are limited by calcium. There was an amazing experiment done in New Hampshire in a sugar bush that had roughly the same amount <clears throat> of acid rain as Ontario has had over time. They added the missing calcium and the stream in the watershed dried up because the forest completely woke up and pumped 25% more water than it had in their entire record. So what will happen if we can get ash into the forest is my prediction. The trees will, physiology will work better. They'll have better control of their pores. They'll actually absorb more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. They'll make more wood. My estimate is 20% more, and that comes from studies done in Quebec. 20% more wood and tie up that, that much more carbon. And carbon tied up in wood is tied up for a very long time, especially if we use that wood to build homes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I live in a house with wooden superstructure. My house was built in 1885. Um, the carbon in that wood would have been captured by those trees between 1800 and 1885. So it's already 200 year old carbon and hopefully my house will last for a lot longer. So if we get enough ash to the forests that need that are currently suffering from calcium decline, and we've got de a few decades to do this, um, we should increase our carbon capture by, I believe, don't hold me to this number, 300,000 tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent a year, which starts to be a number that's significant quantitatively in terms of the total greenhouse gas emissions in Muskoka. That's, thank you, that, that was great. I think that was a really good summary of, of uh, why that is important on so many different fronts. Uh, it, it just seems, it seems like a solution that is uh, helping in a number of different ways. And so now we're gonna bounce to a different uh, sort of part of the talk. Uh, that, that's a great question that I think people don't know enough about. So. Uh, I, um, we we touched on salt already, so I wanted to touch on algae. So uh, what is the difference between an algae bloom and a toxic algae bloom? Um, are they actually different? Uh, do we have both in Muskoka? Sure. An algal bloom uh, just means there's suddenly a lot more algae in the lake than there was last week. And um, it's, it's neither good nor bad. Um, let me just remind everyone that we'd be blind, stupid, hungry, and dead without algae. You know, in general, algae have been very good for the world. There'd be no free oxygen without algae. We'd all be blind without algae. Um, um, anyway, that's, I'm off on a tangent here. But every once in a while, algae go bad. And if there is a bloom of algae formed by what are called blue-green algae, which are actually a bacteria, cyanobacteria, that's more risky. They don't necessarily produce toxins but they can. So if you see surface gums of algae in, in a lake, it's very important to uh, inform uh, the, uh, and, and the local medical health officer uh, and the Ministry of the Environment to get samples taken. And they will look at what those algae are and more importantly, and they'll uh, sample um, the water for toxins. Um, we have a couple of lakes Three Mile Lake, Brandy Lake, that typically have had algal blooms that have had some toxins in them. Uh, the scary thing is we're now getting more lakes with blue-green algal blooms. I don't know how many of them have toxins, uh, but if but I should point out that if they're confirmed to have toxins, and there's a lot of a lot of the algae and a lot of toxins, that it is it's not to be treated lightly. Don't let your dog drink that water. Dogs have been killed. Cattle have been killed, and people have been killed. Um, where people were killed was actually in South America, and it wasn't from drinking the water. It's that there was a hospital that drew water from a lake, and the, the treatment technology that was used to clean the water didn't remove the toxins. 
and a number of people that were on dialysis were actually killed because they were being dialyzed with water that had blue-green algal toxins in it. Boiling the water isn't enough. Um, uh, that won't necessarily deal with it. Now, the good thing is, the good thing is it's still fairly rare in Muskoka. My worry is when it starts happening in a lake like Dixon Lake, you know, Gonkin Park, that it might be in our future. So we better figure it out um, soon. <laughs> Great, thanks, Norm. Um, I, I guess this is a great question. Uh, since so many people burn wood, why don't people use ash um, on ice in their driveway? Is, is that a thing? Sure. Um, let me just point out that the calcium decline problem in lakes is not uniformly distributed around Muskoka. Um, it, it's a problem in the north, the lakes in the northeast part of the watershed that have no people. Um, so most of that 50% of lakes that are suffering crayfish deaths and that kind of thing are in Algonquin Park and the northeast part of the watershed. The southwest part of the watershed, Lake Muskoka, calcium levels have not declined in the last 40 years. Salt levels have gone up. Calcium levels have not declined. And the reason is probably linked that people have done all kinds of things on their properties, including adding ash to their driveways um, or bringing in limestone bedrock or fertilizing their lawn and things like that, that have made up, it's another unintended consequence, but this one is a good one, of the fact that calcium levels have been falling in the, in the incoming uh, stream water and rainwater. Uh, and that's led to declining calcium levels in the Northeast part of the watershed, but people have been adding ash and other sources of calcium in the developed part of the watershed to, to correct for that natural decline. So if you wanna take your ash and add it to your uh, driveway, go for it. If you wanna make soap, go for it. If you wanna add it to your forest, make sure it is cold. The last thing I'll ever recommend is people adding ashes to their forests that aren't ice cold. But then the question is, where do you add it? Um, the softwoods, the conifers don't need it so much. It's the hardwoods that need it. What I recommend you do is go to the Ash Muskoka website and find out when the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed is having their next ash drive and bring that ash to us. We will clean it, um, screen it, analyze it, and then use it in, to help us understand how much ash is really needed to correct, uh, to make the forest healthy again and correct this problem. <clears throat> that's uh, that's a great answer. Thanks very much. Um, so there's a question from Noella here. Um, Hi, where in Canada is an area given rights as a person that you mentioned? She said it meant, uh, makes her think of New Zealand trailblazing that idea. Yeah, Noella, it's actually, okay, I'm going to plug Peter Sale's latest book. So get a copy of Peter Sale's latest book on coral reefs. And there's a whole chapter in there which has a big section on the places in the world where nature has been given the rights of personhood. It did happen in New Zealand. It's also happened in a couple of countries in South America. And recently, and I, I'm, in, it's a river in Quebec. Um, and I can't remember the name of the river or exactly what happened, but it's very, very interesting. Um, I have a good friend in a discussion group I'm in who's a lawyer who says it's a terrible idea. His alternative is to say, people have rights, but people also have responsibilities. And if you know, we are responsible for looking after the environment. So the question is, how do we better look after nature? Do we give it rights of personhood? Or do we try and get persons that already have the rights of personhood to live up to their responsibilities to look after this inanimate thing called nature. And I think you could have a very interesting discussion in our imaginarium about which of those would be the, the, the better approach to looking after nature. Well, thank you, uh, Norm. Uh, obviously the last year in terms of fundraising, in terms of just getting together, discussion, meeting, um, has been challenging. So the question from Sherry, uh, and we've just got time for maybe one or two more here, but um, has it been challenging during COVID-19 to gain momentum for events, projects, awareness, et cetera? Oh yeah, it certainly has. 
Um, we haven't, and I think every NGO, every charity, every not-for-profit shares this, not to mention every business um, has had that problem. So in our case, we've had to cancel ash drives um, we haven't actually been allowed, you know, we work with half a dozen graduate students from a couple of universities and they haven't been allowed to go into the bush and study the benefits, document the benefits of our ash additions. So that's kind of slowed us down. Um, but we remain committed uh, uh, within hopefully a month to pick up our activities again. Uh, like the Discovery Center, like this webinar, we've switched to almost entirely Zoom-based meetings of our board, that kind of thing. But it will be really nice to be able to get back to the point where we can meet in person and get back out into those forests and look to see the benefits of our ash additions and hopefully start up new work on the benefits of ash to help solve the climate change problem in Muskoka. Thanks, Norm. That's great. Um, so I, I guess uh, we're just about at uh, 6.15, so maybe we'll just take one or two more here quickly. Uh, maybe a quick comment on this one. I've heard uh, from usually reliable sources uh, that uh, Magoho pines as a roadside plant actually absorb road salt brine. Um, any comment? It's a very specific example. Well, every once in a while when you know absolutely nothing, you should admit it. So I know absolutely nothing about that, so I'm gonna say I don't know. Um, there are certainly halophilic plants, and um, so plants that love salt, and uh, but that's not the solution to the road salt problem. Gotcha. And maybe uh, uh, maybe we have time for one more from Pam Hill here. Uh, if we want to plant trees to replace dying or dead trees, uh, what do you recommend to be planted to replace them? It's a great question. Um, so I recommend uh, native plants for sure. And then if at all possible, you would start by thinking more like a gardener than a logger. So as a gardener, you know you can't add, you can't get crop out of your garden if you don't keep the soil healthy. The same is actually true of the forest. And if you think of a typical Muskoka forest, the soil is only a foot thick and it lost half of all of its calcium. So you can plant trees that need less calcium. So for example, birch need less calcium than maple, uh, and conifers need less calcium uh, than maple or birch. But uh, before you do that, um, think about restoring the health of the soil by sprinkling uh, some cold ash in the area um, that you're gonna do the planting. If you're in Muskoka and it's thin soil. And if you wonder how much, um, <clears throat> it would be about a 20 kilogram pail of ash over an area that's about 100 square meters. So an area that's 30 feet by 30 feet, 10 meters by 10 meters. If you add about uh, 20 kilograms of ash, that will replace all the calcium lost to acid rain. That's, that is great, Norm. Um, well, I think we'll, we'll uh, I think we should leave it there. I think your talk was a really great way to, uh, to summarize all of the discussions we've had and bring them to, uh, to a very eloquent ending. So we really appreciate that. Um, and we love how you tied in themes from each, uh, each, each area and presented us with the idea to imagine a better future or an Imaginarium. So I really, I sort of like that theme uh, running through it. Uh, I know I've been very happy uh, and privileged to be the moderator here and present the series. Uh, there's a lot of people that work very hard behind the scenes, of course, um, uh, and Jordan and John. Um, and so we wanted to thank everyone for attending our, our speaker series. We wanted to thank all of our speakers very much um, uh, for, for joining us and, and look forward to keep, keep tuned to the district website, to the Mistoka Steamships Discovery website. Um, look for the ASH project. I think we, we've put a link in the chat there to that. Um, I know there's also uh, the Watershed Council has a meeting tomorrow and they have a presentation from um, Barb Veal, who's the Director of Watershed Development in Halton on Integrated Watershed Management. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff going on all across Muskoka. And I think Norm said it best. We have all these different uh, teams that are working together and I think the Steamship Discovery Center is, is a place we can come together uh, for these sort of talks but I think it's really important all the different projects that are going on and that we we keep connected. So uh, with that I would uh, turn it 
to John Miller, uh, and just one more thank you to, to Norm and Dr. Nguyen tonight. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, John. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and, and thank you to Dr. Norman Yan for his presentation. Uh, a wonderful fitting end to uh, our webinar, and I love the Imaginarium idea. Uh, so we're going to talk about that some more. So also thanks to Kevin, Jordan, and Ann uh, for their work in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, this concludes our sustainability series. We've learned a lot, uh, as, uh, as Kevin has said. We hope that uh, you, our audience, have found value in these presentations. I can tell you the feedback we've received has been overwhelming and we've had uh, over 800 people attend uh, in total. So, uh, so just so you know, as a result of that, we're planning more webinars on sustainability and our Indigenous themes. Uh, but already in the planning stages is a webinar series uh, on the wooden boats of Muskoka. Uh, this series will bring the audience into the private boathouses around Muskoka to showcase the fabulous wooden boats that make this region famous, um, along with intriguing stories from their owners uh, and the boat builders about their history uh, and the stewardship that has pre uh, preserved them to this day. So I think you'll really enjoy the behind the scenes look uh, and presentation. So stay in tune for more information about that. So thank you again to uh, all of our presenters over the last six weeks, our staff and directors who made this series possible, uh, Kevin Boyle, our moderator, and to our audience. Uh, have a wonderful evening and stay safe.